in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the abracast. We are the brave and the bold. Before sunrise. O oh, heaven above me, pure and deep, you abyss of light. Seeing you, I tremble with God. Like desires to throw myself into your height. That is my depth to hide in your purity. That is my innocence. Gods are shrouded by their beauty. Thus you conceal your stars. You do not speak. Thus you proclaim your wisdom to me. Today you rose from me silently over the roaring sea. Your love and your shyness are revelation to my roaring soul. That you came to me beautiful, shrouded in your beauty, and you speak to me silently, revealing your wisdom. Oh, how should I not guess all that is shy in your soul before the sun you came to me, the loneliest of all? We are friends from the beginning and we share grief and ground and gray dread. We even share the sun. We do not speak to each other because we know too much. We are silent to each other and we smile our knowledge at each other. Are you not the light from my fire? Have you not the sister soul to my insights? Together we have learned everything. Together we have learned to ascend over ourselves to ourselves and to smile cloudlessly, to smile down cloudlessly from bright eyes and from a vast distance when constraint and contrivance and guilt steam beneath us like rain. And when I wandered alone, for whom did my soul hunger at night on false paths? And then I climbed mountains. Whom did I always seek on the mountains, if not you? And all my wandering and mountain climbing were sheer necessity and a help in my helplessness. And I want with all my will is to fly, to fly up to you. And whom did I hate more than drifting clouds and all that stains you? And I hated even my own hatred because it stained you. I loathe the drifting clouds, those stealthy great cats which prey on what you and I have in common. The uncanny, unbound, yes, and amen. We loathe these mediators and mixers, the drifting clouds that are half and half. And we learn neither to bless nor to curse from the heart. Rather, would I sit in a barrel under closed heavens? Rather, sit in the abyss without a heaven? And I see you, bright heaven Stained by drifting clouds. And often I had the desire to tie them fast with the jagged golden wires of lightning. That like thunder I might beat the big drums of their kettle belly. An angry kettle drummer because they robbed me. Of your yes and amen. O oh, heaven over me, pure and light. You abyss of light because they rob you of my yes and amen. For I prefer even noise and thunder and storm curses to this deliberate doubting cat's calm. 
and among men, too, I hate most of the soft treaders. And those who are half and half and doubting and tottering drift clouds. Here, here. And whoever cannot bless should learn to curse. This bright doctrine fell to me from a bright heaven. This star stands in my heaven even in black nights. But I am one who can bless and say yes if only you are about me, pure and light. You abyss of light. Then I carry the blessings of my yes into all abysses, and I have become one who blesses and says yes. And I fought long for that and was a fighter that I might one day get my hands free to bless. But this is my blessing to stand over every single thing. It is my own heaven. It is round roof and azure bell. And eternal security and blessed is he who blesses thus. For all things have been baptized in the well of eternity and all beyond good and evil. And good and evil themselves are but intertwining shadows and damp depressions of drifting clouds. Verily, it is a blessing and not a blasphemy when I teach. Over all things stand the heaven. Accident, the heaven. Innocence, the heaven. Chance, the heaven. Prankishness. By chance, that is the most ancient nobility of the world. And this I restore to all things. I deliver them from their bondage under purpose. This freedom and heavenly cheer I have placed over all things like an azure bell. When I taught that over them and through them no eternal will wills. This prankish folly I've put into the place of this will when I taught in everything, one thing is impossible. Rationality. A little reason to be sure. A seed of wisdom scattered from star to star. This living uh, is mixed in with all things for folly's sake. Wisdom is mixed with all things. A little wisdom is possible indeed. But this blessed certainty I found in all things that they would rather dance on the feet of chance. O oh, heaven over me, pure and high, this is what your purity is to me now. There is no eternal spider or spider web of reason. And you are to me a dance floor for divine accidents. That you are to me a divine table for divine dice and dice players. But you blush. Did I speak the unspeakable? Did I blaspheme wishing to bless you? Or is it the shame of twosomeness that makes you blush? Do you bid me to go and be silent because the day is coming now? The world is deep and deeper than day had ever been aware. Not everything may be put to words if the presence of the day, but the day is coming so let us part. O oh, heaven over me, bashful and glowing. O oh, you, my happiness before sunrise, the day is coming, so let us part. Thus spoke Zarathustra. The Abracast, occult, history, conspiracy, and violence.
Hey everybody, I'm John. This is the Abercast with Wednesday Book Club. We're still working our way through Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Because I took a weekend off to go to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, home of the Mothman, <laughs> with uh, uh, I met up with Justin Rimmel from Mysterious Circumstances, and uh, I finally got to meet Diane Student um, from History Goes Bump. I actually did an episode with them back in the day. Like, it's like episode number two or three, I think, History Goes Bump. Um, they were doing a live a podcast event with hillbilly horror stories and i went down there uh basically on a whim i was like i'm gonna go down there <laughs> and uh got to meet those guys so my recording schedule got messed up a little bit so i'm doing two zarathustras in one weekend so um yeah so i apologize if it's like extra sloppy or something it's my fault You can fucking blame the Mothman. You can get on my Instagram. <laughs> you can get on my Instagram and see uh, what I think about the Mothman. <laughs> All right. So if you're playing along at home, now is the time for you to summon your vessel of the art here. When I was in West Virginia, um, uh, I pulled my vessel of the art out <laughs> to mix a drink in it. And Rimmel was like, oh, I've got to get a picture of that thing battle scarred vessel of the art but now is the time for you to summon your vessel of the art mix up your favorite weapon of mass distraction in there and raise your vessel high to the air like tangled twines of lightning and say here's to you my patreon and subscribe star supporters here's to you for giving a damn and making this show what it is thank you very much All right, back to the book. We're going to fucking do it. So the next speech is on virtue that makes small. It's a multi-part speech. When Zarathustra was on land again, he did not proceed straight to his mountain in his cave but he undertook many ways and questions and found out this and that. So that he said to himself, joking, behold, a river that flows winding and twisting back to its source. For he wanted to determine that what had happened to man. Meanwhile, whether he had become greater or smaller. And once he saw a roll of new houses, and he was amazed and said, what do these houses mean? Verily, no great soul put them up as its likeness. Might an idiotic child have taken them out of his toy box? Would that another child might put them back into his box? In these rooms and chambers, can men go in and out of them? They look to me as if they were made for silken dolls, for the stealthy nibblers who probably also let themselves be nibbled stealthily. And Zarathustra stood still and reflected. At last, he said sadly, everything has become smaller. Everywhere I see lower gates. Those who are of my kind probably still go through, but they must stoop. This reminds me of like a courtroom, right? Like how they have that little tiny swinging door that you kind of have to like bow, like you kind of have to like crouch down to open up. Oh, when shall I get back to my homeland where I need no longer stoop, no longer stoop before those who are small? And Zarathustra sighed and he looked into the distance. On that same day, however, he made his speech on virtue that makes small. 
I walk among this people and I keep my eyes open. They do not forgive me that I do not envy their virtues. They bite at me because I say to them, small people need small virtues. And because I find it hard to accept that small people are needed. So I've, um, I've been saying as I've reading this book, so like I'm trapped in my own paradigm, right? I've been saying that Nietzsche is predicting social justice warriors and cancel culture, but I forgot <laughs> that Nietzsche is also predicting the communist revolution. You know what I mean? So, you know, by he's predicting SJWs and cancel culture as an echo of communism. So I think that might be interesting thing to think about while we're getting into this. The small things on virtue that makes small back to it. I am still like the rooster in a strange yard where the hens also bite at him. But I am not angry with the hens on that account. I am polite to them as to all small annoyances. <laughs> to be prickly to what is small strikes me as wisdom for hedgehogs. So this is funny because it's like <laughs> he just called people that attack him chicken heads. <laughs> I like that. That's funny. I'm going to use that. Here, here, Freddy. They all speak of me when they sit around the fire in the evening and they speak of me, but no one thinks of me. This is the new stillness I have learned. Their noise concerning me spreads like a cloak over my thoughts. They noise among themselves. What would this gloomy cloud bring us and let us to it that it does not bring us plague. And recently a woman tore back her child when it wanted to come to me. Take this child away, she cried. Such eyes scorch children's souls. They cough when I speak. <laughs> they think a cough is an argument against strong winds. They guess nothing of the roaring of my happiness. We have no time yet for Zarathustra, they argue. What matters a time that has no time for Zarathustra? And when they praise me, how could I go to sleep on their praise? They praise, uh, their praise is a belt of thorns to me. It scratches me even as I shake it off. And this too, I have learned among them. He who gives praise poses as if they were giving back. But in truth, however, he wants more gifts. Ask my foot whether it likes the way of lauding or luring. Verily, after such a beat at the tick-tock, it was no wish either to dance or to stand still. They would laud and lure me to small virtue. They would persuade my foot into the tick-tock of small happiness. I walk among this people and I keep my eyes open. They have become smaller and they are becoming smaller and smaller, but this is due to their doctrine of happiness and virtue for they are modest in virtue too, because they want contentment, but only a modest virtue gets along with contentment. To be sure, even they learn their way to stride and to stride forward. And I call it their hobbling. Thus, they become a stumbling block 
for everyone who is in a hurry, and many among them walk forward while looking backwards and their neck stiff. I like running into them. Foot and eye should not lie nor give the lie to each other. But there is much lying among the small people. Some of them will, but most of them are only willed. Some of them are genuine, but most of them are bad actors. There are unconscious actors among them, and involuntary actors and genuine are always rare. Especially genuine actors. There is little of man here, therefore their women strive to be mannish. Pay attention. I'm going to do it again. Not for you. I understand you got it. I'm going to do it again for me. There is little of man here. Therefore, their women strive to be mannish, for only he who is man enough will release the woman in his woman. And this hypocrisy I found to be the worst among them. And even those who command hypocritically feign the virtues of those who serve. I serve you. Serve, we serve, thus prayers, even the hypocrisy of the rulers and woe. If the first Lord is merely the first servant, alas, into their hypocrisies too are the curiosities. My eyes flew astray, and well, I guess their fly happiness and their humming Around sunny window panes, so much kindness and so much weakness do I see. So much justice and pity and so much weakness around righteousness and kind they are to each other. Round like grains of sand, righteous and kind with grains of sand, modestly to embrace a small happiness that they call resignation. And modestly they squint the while for another small happiness. At bottom, these simplifications want single things, most of all, that nobody should hurt them. Thus, <laughs> they try to please and gratify everybody. This, however, is cowardice, even if it be called virtue. And if they once speak roughly, these small people, I hear only their hoarseness. For every draft makes them hoarse. They are clever. Their virtues have clever fingers, but they lack fists. Their fingers do not know how to hide behind fists. Virtue to them is that which makes modest and tame. With that, they have turned the wolf into a dog and man himself into man's best domestic animal. We have placed our chair in the middle, your smirking says to me. And exactly as far from dying fighters as from amused sows that, however, his mediocrity, through, though it be called moderation. And that reminds me, we have a time honored axiom here at the Abercast. If something is worth doing, it's worth overdoing. And with that, I'm going to give... One of these. I <laughs> back to it. I walk among this people and I let many a word drop, but they know neither how to accept it or how to retain. They are amazed 
that I do not come to revile venery and vice, and verily, I did not come to warn against pickpockets either. They are amazed that I am not prepared to teach wit to their cleverness and to wed it as if they did not have enough clever boys whose voices screech like slate pencils. And when I shout curse all cowardly devils in you who like to whine and fold their hands and pray, they shout Zarathustra is godless and they're Teachers of resignation shouted especially, but it is precisely into their ears that I like to shout. Yes, I am Zarathustra the godless. These teachers of resignation, whatever is small and sick and scabby, they crawl to like lice. And only my nausea prevents me from squashing them. Well then, this is my preaching for their ears. I am Zarathustra the godless who speaks. Who is more godless than I? That I might delight in his instruction. And I am Zarathustra the godless. Where shall I find my equal? (laughs) <laughs> and all those are my equals who give themselves to their own will and reject their resignation. I am Zarathustra, the godless. I still cook every chance in my pot and only when it has been cooked through there do I welcome it as my food and verily many a chance come to me domineeringly but my will spoke to it still more domineeringly and immediately it lay imploring on its knees imploring that it might find a hearth and heart in me and urging with flattery look Zarathustra how only a friend come to his friend But why do I speak where nobody has my ears? And so let me shout it out into the wind. You are becoming smaller and smaller, you small people. You are crumbling, you comfortable ones. You will yet perish of your many small virtues of your many small abstentions, of your many small resignations. Too considerate, too yielding is your soul. But that a tree might become a great, it must strike hard roots around hard rocks. What you abstain from two weaves at the web of all human future, your nothing too is a spider web. And a spider which lives on the blood of the future, and when you receive it, is like stealing, you small men of virtue. But even among rogues, honor says one should steal only one where cannot rob. It will give eventually, that is another teaching of resignation. But I tell you who are comfortable, it will take, and it will take more and more from you. Oh, that you would reject all half-heartedly willing and would become resolute in sloth and deed. Alas, that you would understand my word. Do whatever you will, but first be such as are able to will. Man. So I'm going to be redoing my Thelema, some of my Thelema episodes, specifically the Book of the Law. Libra 1, 2, and 3. I'm probably going to wind up redoing all of the Jack Parsons stuff, too. And uh, repackaging Libra 4. 
um, because I've been revisiting that stuff. Uh, so I haven't really talked a whole lot about it. I'm, I'm like down 25 pounds. I'm down 25 pounds. Um, and the reason I'm down 25 pounds is because of this book <laughs> and Alistair Crowley and Jack Parsons. Um, and I want to get, I want to find a way to talk about it. Uh, but I need to make sure everything's current first. Um, all of this will stuff, all of this, um, I mean, I guess I can say Pantera too. I don't know, whatever. But literally what Nietzsche just said here, alas, you would um, understand my word, do whatever you will, but first be such as you are able to will, is basically the book of the law. And basically, at least Lieber 2, maybe Lieber 1 and 2, the message of the master theory on. Anyhow, back to it. Do, <laughs> I need to get to the break. So uh, do... Back to the book. Do your do love your neighbor as yourself, but first be such as love themselves. Loving with a great love, loving with great contempt. Thus speaks Zarathustra, the godless. But why do I speak where no one has my ears? It is still an hour too early for me here. I am my own uh, persecutor. Among this people, my own cocks crow through dark lanes, but their hour will come and mine will come to hourly. They are becoming smaller, poorer, more sterile, poor herbs, poor soil. And soon they will stand there like dry grass and prairie and verily wary of themselves and languishing even more than their water for free. Oh, blessed hour of lightning. Oh, secret before noon. I yet hope to turn them into galloping fires and heralds with my fiery tongues that they shall proclaim with fiery tongues. It is coming. It is near the great noon. Thus, Spoke Zarathustra. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content and access to the private Abracast workgroup by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. On this month's exclusive Order of the Fellowcraft episode... To hear the names of white men and others who it was said had also met or seen these creatures. She went after these persons too and found out that in due course that it was so. And they, uh, in turn, had not been saying anything for fear of ridicule. I withhold their names too as I do not have permission of any to publish them. Said human kids on reaching the age of reason turned out not to want to talk about this abomination while their parents were most definitely did not and do not want to talk about it. Nonetheless, they have talked a bit and I pass it on to you for what it is worth. We've made five investigation trips and have for evidence a finger print lifted off a house window including a plaster cast of a footprint, uh, personal taped accounts of the creature, plus many interviews. This includes photographs. He is seven feet tall, 400 pounds. That's a big motherfucker. 
can move at tremendous speeds, jump tremendous distances. No news items concerning this being have been printed in the Portland papers. He displays extreme cunning walks and runs. Whoa, this is personal. He displays extreme cunning. He walks and runs erect. Appears frustrated. Acts as if he would like to communicate. He makes extremely high pitched sounds. Um, But if you want to stay till afterwards, I'll tell you, (laughs) I've never talked about this. (laughs) I told my wife about it last night at the, at a campfire while I was deciding what I was going to do with this episode. So I've never told any very literally a fraction, like maybe three other human beings, this story, but I'll tell you my fucking Bigfoot story. If you hang on after this. Support the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Upon the Mount of Olives. Winter, a wicked guest is sitting at home with me. My hands are blue from the handshake of his friendship. I honor this wicked guest, but I like to let him sit alone. I like to run away from him. And if one runs well, one escapes him with warm feet and warm thoughts. I run where the wind stands still in the sunny nook of my Mount of Olives. There, I laugh at my severe guest and I am still well disposed towards him. For catching the flies at home and for silencing such small noise... For he does not suffer when a mosquito would sing or even two. And even makes the lane lonely until the moonlight is afraid at night. He is a hard guest, but I honor him. And I do not pray like the pampered and the pot belly fire idol. Even a little chattering of the teeth rather than adoring idols. Thus, my nature dictates that I have a special grudge against all fire idols. Come on, baby. One of my cats are going nuts. Hey, be cool. Be cool, bitch. Thus, my nature dictates that I have a special grudge against all fire idols that are in heat, steaming, and musty. Whomever I love, I love better in winter than in summer. I mock my enemies better and more heartily since winter dwells in my home, heartily in truth, even when I crawl into bed. Even my hidden happiness still laughs and is full of pranks. Even the dream that lies to me still laughs. I, a crawler? Even in my life, I have crawled before the mighty. And if ever I lied, I lied about love. Therefore, I am glad in the wintry bed too. The simple bed warms me more than a rich one, for I am jealous of my poverty, and in winter, it is most faithful to me. I begin every day with a bit of malice. I mock the winter with a cold bath <laughs> that makes me uh, makes my severe house guest grumble. Besides, I like to tickle him with a little wax candle to make him 
let the sky come out of the ashen gray twilight at last. For I am especially malicious in the morning, in that early hour when the pail rattles at the well and the horses whinny warmly through the gray lanes. Then I wait impatiently for the bright sky to rise before me at last. The snow bearded winter sky, the old man with his white hair, the winter sky so tack turned that it is often tactfully hides even the sun. When it from him that I learn the long, bright silence. Or did he learn it from me? Or did each of us invent it independently, the origin of all good things? Is thousandfold. For good prankish things leap into existence from sheer joy. How could one expect them to do that? Only once. Long silence too is good as a prankish thing. And to look out for a brightly rounded eye face like the winter sky. So tactically to hide one's sun and one's indomitable solar will. Verily this art is the winter prank that I have learned well. It is my favorite malice and art that my silence has learned not to betray itself through silence. Rattling with discourse and dice, I outwit those who wait solemnly. My will and purpose shall elude all these severe inspectors. That no one may discern my ground and ultimate will. For that I have invented my long, bright silence. Many I have found who were clever. They veiled their faces and muddied their waters that nobody might see through them deep down. But precisely to them came the clever mistrusters and nutcrackers. Precisely their most hidden fish were fished out. And it is the bright, the bold, the transparent who were the cleverest among those who were silent and their ground is down so deep that even their brightest water does not betray it. You snow bearded, silent winter sky, you round eyed white head above me. Oh, you heavenly parable that may souls and its pranks. And I must. I not conceal myself. Like one who has swallowed gold. Lest they slit open my soul. Must. I not walk on stilts. And they overlook my long legs. All these grudge joys and drudge boys who surround me. <laughs> I like that. Uh, these smoky room temperature used up wilted fretful souls. How could their grudge endure my happiness? And hence, I show them only the ice and the winter of my peaks. And not... That my mountain still winds all the belts of the sun around itself. And they hear only my winter winds whistling. And not that I have also crossed the warm seas like a long, heavy south wind. They still have pity on my accidents, but my words say... Let accidents come to me. They are not innocent as little children. And how could they endure my happiness if I did not wrap my happiness in accidents and winter distresses and polar bear caps and covers of snowy heavens? 
if I myself did not have mercy on their pity, which is the pity of grudge joys and drudge boys. If I myself did not sigh before them and chatter with cold, patiently suffer them to wrap up their pity. This is the wise. Oh boy. Frolicsomeness and friendliness of my soul that it does not conceal its winter and its icy winds, nor does it conceal the chill blains. Loneliness can be the escape of the sick. Loneliness can also be the escape from the sick. Let them hear me chatter, chatter and sigh through the winter cold. All these poor jealous jokers around me with such sighing and chattering. I still escape their heated rooms, sighing and chattering. I still escape their heated rooms and let them suffer and sigh over my chillblains. The ice of knowledge will yet freeze him to death. They moan. Meanwhile, I run crisscross on my mount of olives with warm feet. In the sunny nook of my mount of olives, I sing and I mock all pity. Thus sang Zarathustra. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a 5-star rate and review. On this month's exclusive Order of the Fellowcraft episode... Hear the names of white men and others who, it was said, had also met or seen these creatures. She went after these persons too and found out that in due course that it was so. And they, uh, in turn, had not been saying anything for fear of ridicule. I withhold their names too as I do not have permission of any to publish them. Said human kids on reaching the age of reason turned out not to want to talk about this abomination while their parents were most definitely did not and do not want to talk about it. Nonetheless, they have talked a bit and I pass it on to you for what it is worth. We made five investigation trips and have for evidence a fingerprint lifted off a house window including a plaster cast of a footprint of uh, personal taped accounts of the creature plus many interviews. This includes photographs. He is seven feet tall, 400 pounds. That's a big motherfucker. Can move at tremendous speeds, jump tremendous distances. No news items concerning this being have been printed in the Portland papers, he displays extreme cunning walks and runs. Whoa, this is personal. He displays extreme cunning. He walks and runs erect, appears frustrated, acts as if he would like to communicate. He makes extremely high pitched sounds. But if you want to stay till afterwards, I'll tell you, <laughs> I've never talked about this. <laughs> I told my wife about it last night at the, at a campfire while I was deciding what I was going to do with this episode. So I've never told any very literally a fraction, like the maybe three other human beings, this story, but I'll tell you my fucking Bigfoot story. If you hang on after this. <laughs>